Prima Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly is interviewing Colin Lopesher of Hive Hydrogen, which is developing the proposed 105 billion rand green hydrogen to green ammonia project at the Kucha Industrial Development Zone in Quebecer, Nelson Mandela Bay. Hi, Colin. It's great to chat to you once again. What is the latest news regarding the development of phase one of the green hydrogen to green ammonia project at the Kucha Industrial Development Zone in Quebec? We've really hit a major milestone now in terms of the project, and we're moving from what we call mid-stage development to advanced stage. And, and this is a really exciting time for us. What has happened in the project is we have now completed all our pre-feed studies or the front-end engineering design piece and the molecule portion, and all the renewable energy assets are proceeding to plan. So what that means for the project is now we are preparing to go into uh, front-end engineering design for the final stage of the plant design work, um, which is huge, obviously, from a, a project development point of view but also has a huge implication because we're also starting our um, request for information process with all the engineering procurement and construction companies, both uh, global and local. Um, And that will start going out this week. You know, this is a really exciting stage for us to move the project forward. The other side of things is, of course, the strategic investors that we've recently head out to South Africa. We had a delegation of 19 people from Japan. We've got a few more delegations coming, some from Europe and potentially from the US as well. So the project has a lot of momentum and it's moving at the right pace and and in the right direction. And will funding still be a combination of 70% debt and 30% equity? And is the final investment decision still expected by the end of next year? Martin, absolutely. So uh, we're working on a 70-30 debt component to equity, maybe slightly improved if we can get the DFIs to do that. And the FID date is still on target for the end of next year. So a huge amount of work obviously still to go. A lot of planning processes in the mix at the moment, particularly obviously juggling the molecule and the electron side. So we have to make sure we can deliver the electrons for the molecule portion. And some of that goes through a process, and that is a process that takes time. So we have been extremely encouraged by how Eskim has been approaching this and how they've worked with us. And that's been a big help. And obviously the new change from bringing the Minister of Energy and Minister of Electricity into one portfolio will be a further boost. And as you know, on the 1st of July, the National Transmission Company started operating independently from distribution and generation for for Eskim. So all the right things are happening for the project from a regulatory and process point of view. And the time it takes is, is a reflection, obviously, of the scale and size of the project, but also the internal processes we need to follow to get there, which I think was pretty standard. South Africa is not putting any obstacles at at all in our way. So that's still on track. And so how early next year will the actual building of the 3.6 gigawatt renewable energy begin? Martin, it'll only start in 26. So there won't be any building next year. It's all preparation. We obviously have environmental studies that will be coming to to finality. Um, We have got uh, full environmental approvals now, another new step forward for all our solar projects. And the wind is is really taking shape. So we can only start building once we've been through all the, the processes that allow us to build. So that would be expected in early 26. What South Africa needs is they need a grid strengthening in the central part of the country. Um, And this will help, obviously, reduce the dependency on transmission from the the generation in the north. Our project is injecting power into the grid in the central part of the country, mainly around Da'ar and Beaufort West. And as a result of what we require, the grid is undergoing a full grid strengthening, both in terms of what the transmission development side is doing under an agreed plan that they've published, 
which is, is public record. And then we have some smaller components that we are bringing to bear on the transmission development side, which will enable other IPPs to join the grid. What is positive and encouraging is that the ESCOM is, is really moving forward strongly on their grid strengthening and their build-out plans uh, to enhance and increase the scale of the grid. And that's really helping us uh, as a project and actually, in a, in a way, reducing some of our financial burden. So everything is is really being embraced by the government in terms of the hydrogen economy, but also in terms of the electrical requirements. And I think we'll we'll see more and more of that over the next few months. And regarding offtake, how are the discussions going with Itoshu Corporation of Japan on offtake? So, Martin, as you know, we signed a memorandum of cooperation with them in December last year. And one of the huge components and almost a daily activity in my life is talking to off-takers. And that's gone exceptionally well. So we're very confident of the off-take position in terms of both the European off-take and in the Far East. And the exciting development now is all the contract for different programs are starting to come out. So we'll see uh, in the next couple of weeks at the most some real direction in, in terms of how those contracts will look for Korea and Japan. And we're also seeing huge shifts now um, in Europe in demand for the first time out of the fertilizer industry for green ammonia and um, more and more for industry looking at cracking ammonia back to hydrogen. But we're very focused on Japan, Korea and on the green fertilizer industry in, in Europe. And what is exciting for future phases, and, and maybe even a little bit for the first phase, is South Africa's interest is now started to increase around offtake in South Africa. So we have to find a, a balance on that, and we have to fit into all the regulatory regimes that both Japan and Korea have recently announced and are now implementing, and Europe sim similarly. So it's, it's really good timing. I know it's frustrating because you're not seeing... Uh, buildings going up, but the, the nascency of the marketplace, we've anticipated well, and it's now emerging um, as a proper plan. And luckily, we, I think, have, have called it correctly. And are you still going all out to produce the lowest cost green ammonia? Martin, that's absolutely the pillar of what we're trying to do. Um, South Africa as a country suffers quite a lot in terms of being disadvantaged over the places like Australia and the United States where they have subsidy programs. So we have to compete heavily based on what our price structure is. We, we're not going to be given billions of dollars by the South African government, that's for sure. And I don't think they should give it to us. And I think what's happening in places like Australia and America isn't helpful for the developing world where they are subsidizing to try and outcompete the developing world. But saying all that, South Africa has some unique advantages. And if you saw the Green Hydrogen Council reports, saw McKinsey's report, South Africa still really can hold its own, particularly because of the really good renewable assets, wind and solar, which have a big advantage over, over some of those other countries I mentioned, but also because of our fantastic grid, very integrated grid, really fit for purpose, particularly for, for where we are. So we see South Africa as staying really competitive over this next period, and hopefully we'll see a bit more help and support for developing countries coming out of Europe and the US and, and so on. And what are the global supply and demand outlooks for green ammonia? That's the real hot topic is how green ammonia is going to reshape, particularly the maritime industry. So the maritime industry, as you know, is heavy pollutant of the oceans, uh, heavy fuel oils, diesels, not only polluting the air and polluting water with all the spillages and, and so on, but also, you know, big carbonization issues. And we're seeing and looking at the shipping industry now, the number of ships that have been commissioned to run on, on uh, green ammonia is a maritime fuel is exponentially increasing the technology readiness levels of the green ammonia engines for shipping have reached technology readiness level nine which means they're bankable and high quality 
But we also see a revolution in the power side. So I think a lot of people were saying, well, hydrogen is the gas, hydrogen is going to drive hydrogen turbines. We're starting to see ammonia turbines coming out that are ready for, for deployment. So we see huge power station replacing coal power stations, a huge power station demand for, for green ammonia. And that's a really exciting development. We spoke recently to a European project that would require all our annual production of green ammonia to fire their green ammonia power station they're planning. So this, this nascency of the market has started to mature now into an early stage industry. And I think that's exciting. I think it's, it's starting to find traction now um, in the decarbonization global plans. And to what extent is Hive Hydrogen's green hydrogen to green ammonia project aligned with the just energy transition? Martin, that's absolutely a principal focus of ours. And I think the, the challenge has been what is actually happening with the just energy transition itself. We're not seeing anything happening that's significant in that area. So we've aligned ourselves with the principles of it and are getting on with executing our own form of just energy transition. We're quite disappointed, actually, with, with what's actually happening in the country. We'd like to see a lot more activity from the sponsors of that program, and, and hopefully there'll be some good news in the near term coming through with that, but it hasn't worked and hasn't really got momentum yet. So we've got our own momentum in, into it ourselves. We are talking to the, the big direct foreign investment agencies export credit agencies who are very strongly aligned to the Just Energy Transition program and the sustainability goals of the UN. So that's a, a big focus of ours. We're always uh, looking at that. We've done a huge number of community consultations now. We've got a second phase, a third phase actually, of community consultations coming in to try and ensure that that we we maximize that. You know, our whole focus is to try and make this a completely independent project uh, in terms of labor. So we'd like to get 99 to 100% of all the local component with local labor. And that, that's a, a huge focus. We've had people coming out looking to set up factories. We've interviewed, you know, various labor unions and labor players in the market. And we have to bring this to bear. South Africa needs this, particularly because of its coal problems and trying to transform away from there without affecting the livelihoods of the thousands and millions of people that are dependent on the coal industry. So we, we're very close to our heart and something that I think Nelson Mandela Bay has particularly suffered from in the past. So we have to make sure that we produce local jobs and we have to make sure that there's benefits like electricity and water that flow from there to disadvantaged communities. And just how big could the project eventually be? Because we, we have phase one, and then you talk of uh, phase two and three and four. And what are the chances of it sparking off some sort of a, a hydrogen valley in the area? Oh, and absolutely, that is the plan, to, to get a hydrogen valley going. I think the, the natural thing for Nelson Mandela Bay is the automotive industry. And that automotive shift from internal combustion engines running on, on uh, petrol and, and diesel into hydrogen is a few years away. So it'll be after our first phase. But we see already interest in hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And as you, you may have read recently, there's an ammonia internal combustion engine that's just been tested and, and, is, and is working. So that area too is inevitably going to come to South Africa, probably starting with bigger vehicles, heavier vehicles, which struggle with batteries, for example, um, which need to clean up. We have, you know, all these challenges with exports out of South Africa now in terms of using fully decarbonized chains of development. So we see the hydrogen coming inevitably to South Africa. I would think, and we know from the Nelson Mandela Bay Business Chamber, huge focus on trying to bring it in and, and make it the automotive hub 
for hydrogen in uh, in South Africa, at least, and potentially exporting further. But there's a lot of development needed. We have to develop pipelines internally. We have to uh, get some internal projects going, and there's some nice projects starting to develop in the centre part of the country. But it is a real game changer for for the country in terms of fuel reliance and how it, it, it decarbonizes. But it will take a few more years. You know, the world is in, a, in an early stage, but South Africa is definitely well positioned to step into that and and take advantage of it. And will it, when it comes to electrolyzers, what sort of technology have you? decided upon will you be using what we know as PEM technology which is aligned to South Africa's platinum group metals or will you be going a different route the Martin probably not go to PEM it's too expensive so the production of hydrogen is very costly and around uh, uh, these, these exchange membrane electrolyzers and the supply chain of PEM electrolyzers is quite unsure so they're very expensive they can't produce and give us the amount of electrolyzers we need for our project in, in any sort of guaranteed fashion. It also makes use of iridium. So if you look at the global demand of iridium and the amount available, it's quite a tough call to rely on PEM. So we think PEM will play a huge role in small units of production units. It's even being used in very small units to allow things like service stations or, you know, like a truck stop or whatever, to make their own hydrogen. So we see PEM as being very good as a nimble deployment for local production. But for scale production, we've got some some major doubts about it. So our focus has been on alkaline electrolyzers, to, to, more to your point, purely because the, the supply chain is more advanced. They can cope with the capacity. We need 1,200 megawatts of electrolyzers. They can produce it. They don't have a, a long lead time. They are about half the price of PEM electrolyzers. And they um, obviously have, have those advantages. Saying that, we're also looking very closely at solid oxide electrolyzers, which have just started moving from technology readiness level 7 to, to readiness level 8. And once they hit 9, they're bankable. So we're keeping a very close eye on that. And we have had visitors coming to South Africa to explore even setting a factory up in Nelson Mandela Bay. It's a young industry and there's all these exciting developments going on everywhere. Um, And we have to be positioned and opportunistic in a sense to take advantage of them as they arrive. So you can't call it yet. I think there'll be some more improvements in PEM. I think platinum will still be hugely in, in demand for for PEM electrolyzers and others, uh, other forms that are coming out. But it will will certainly, um, in the hydrogen industry, uh, will have a huge role to play, and South Africa is very well positioned. And do you envisage having to use fuel cells at all, or will that just be for the mobility of cars, etc.? Well, the fuel cell is quite good for things like point-to-point vessel movement as well. In the, in the maritime industry, so ferries, for example, uh, smaller vessels, you know, that, that's a much quicker and easier solution for some of them. And then obviously in, in big trucks. In terms of uh, automotive industry, there's some really good fuel cell technologies and vehicles already out on the road. So we do see a, a big future in fuel cell and, and obviously uh, um, South Africa and its mineral side will be able to play a big role in that. So absolutely, yes. The development of internal combustion engines running on hydrogen and ammonia is going to be an interesting space to watch. But the the more likely approach, I think, and it's maybe just personal, is there will be some sort of hybrid solutions for both fuel cell and internal combustion, whether it's fuel, whether it's oil, uh, sorry, or, uh, petrol or diesel, and a combination a bit like the electric cars have today, or whether it'll be something else combined. But we, we definitely see uh, fuel cells as having a major major role in, in the rollout of the industry. Finally, Colin, you know, in addition to Kucha, Hive's also got hub-based models uh, in other parts of the world. I think in Spain, 
and in Chile. How are those projects faring? Chile is a big focus at the moment. Um, it's getting a lot of international attention, and that is a little bit behind where we are, um, but totally different. It's an off-grid uh, project, so it's, it's, it is no uh, linking into the grid. It's in one of the windiest parts of the world with you know, very high wind capacity factors. And that, that project is probably, I would say, about six months behind where we are in, in South Africa. And our Spanish project has quite a nice mix. It's, it's not a green ammonia, it's predominantly hydrogen. And we're providing hydrogen to steelworks, uh, hydrogen to industry uh, with some uh, element of green ammonia. And that's in a really good stage, working on the uh, front-end engineering design at the moment. So that, that's a similar stage, slightly behind, but the offtake demand is, is, is probably more defined there, so that's very helpful. We also have a hydrogen uh, project in Turkey, for the green steel industry. And that's a little bit further off. It's still in its, its sort of nascent stage of development, but that's looking uh, very promising too. Um, and we are considering projects in other other countries. We've been working on on Argentina, but that hasn't been able to meet the benchmarks we need to to make it a success for a global export. So Argentina, I think, as you know, has been through its political turmoil. Uh, we've seen very positive signals coming out of there. So we'll have to be a bit more patient with with the Argentinian one. Petrus Crew Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly, speaking to Colin Lopes of Hive Hydrogen.